for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Tuesday afternoon, June the 21st, 1977. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp and Conference Grounds Summer Camp Meeting being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Brother Wynn Worley of the Cheswick Baptist Church in South Chicago is the speaker of the afternoon speaking on the bread of the children. Brother Glenn, on one thing, that's the Hegwish Baptist Church. <laughs> but um, that's all right. Uh, you have to live in Hegwish to either be able to spell it or pronounce it right. Everybody, they call it everything from Hegewish uh, uh, to Bethsaida or whatever he called it while ago. <laughs> it's kind of a kinky name, but um, praise the Lord. I want Roger to come up here right now and just share a word of testimony. This is Roger Miller. He's not kin to Glenn except their brothers. And uh, so uh, Roger's one of the fine young fellows from our church. He's a preacher of the gospel. You're not supposed to preach. That's my job. <laughs> you can all look at me, I guess. Uh, I'm here to see Jesus Christ glorified. Uh, when I left Chicago, I was... I imagine that I was proud like a lot of us are. And the Lord had to break a lot of my pride on the way down here. And I thought I was coming down here to help people. And God's been ministering to me continually. This afternoon we went out with Glenn and in the truck and we drove around the grounds. And, and God's really got his hand on this earth. And just to see his magnificent beauty, what he can do with the ground. And then to come here and to see what God's doing with people. How he's working in each and every one of our lives and how he's how he's ministering to us. It just blesses my heart. When Wynn asked me to to share a word of testimony, I don't I don't really know where to begin. Jesus Christ has done so much in my life. And I think I think the greatest thing that he's done for me is he's loved me. There was a time when when I was rejected by my parents. I don't get me wrong that my parents loved me. But there's just there's just a certain spirit that works in this in this world today. It's been building up, and it and it causes parents to reject their children in their actions and in the things they say. And this is what happened to me. And I used to be an alcoholic. And I came home one day, and I had a new wife. I I didn't I didn't like what I saw because there was love, there was peace, and there was something I didn't have. And then my wife started claiming scripture, and the Lord touched my heart and saved me. And he, he took me out of he took me out of the old life and he gave me a new life. And I know that everyone here is having the same kind of problem I have, and that's putting on that new life. I get up in the morning and and I know I look in the mirror and I'm the same old me. It's the same old flesh. But Jesus Christ said that that old things pass away and behold, all things become new. Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, he said, "For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation." to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God didn't eliminate anyone. When he, when he sent the Lord Jesus Christ for me, for each and every one of us, it was because of his great love for us. Farther on in Romans it talks that God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm not supposed to preach, so I, I just... <laughs> I've seen I've seen some things down here that just bless my heart. I'm gonna I don't know if it's this pulpit or what it is, but I'm getting excited. I want to jump around like everybody else. Pray for me, because the Lord's liable to, to to really work me over here about a few things. I asked the Lord last night. He woke me up in the middle of the night, and I says, 
the people that fill this pulpit, they have, they've really loved Jesus Christ. God is really working in their lives. And I says, God, I want that in my life. I want the blessing, the blessing David talked about Sunday night, the blessing of eternal life, of that victorious life of, of continually walking in God's light and knowing that we're God's children, that, that I am God's chosen. And... God loves me so much and he loves you so much that he talked this man right here prepared him down in Texas brought him to Chicago had me move to Chicago and God brought us together and he put his big arms around me and God says I love you son and God broke my heart I was hard I still am hard and every time Every time I get down, wind comes up and he gives me a hug and God says, I love you, son. And I say, I don't want that. I <laughs> and God knows what we need. He knows exactly what we need. And God is, God is breaking all of our hearts. He's knitting us together. He's, he's, he's building an army that's going to march through the land victorious. Deliverance is their song and there's healing in their hand. That's what my kids sing a song. It's a chorus and just keeps building up in temple. And... And God's building that army right now. He's taking people from all different walks of life. That I, I didn't know hardly anybody. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I didn't know anybody when I came here other than the people from Chicago. But yet I come up and there's a dear brother there, 75 years old. God, God seasoned him out in Pakistan and brought him. I'm sorry, where's it from, brother? Ethiopia. In Jesus' backyard. And he brought him here and he blessed my heart. And he gave me a kiss over at him just like the kiss of Jesus. The love that... The love that flowed between God just melted my heart. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand what God's doing. God's taking a piece of me and he's putting it in everybody's life. It's not me anymore. It's Christ that lives in me. It's, there's, no, there's no good thing in me. That's what the Bible says. He says, my heart is evil. It's deceitful. It's wicked. He says, who can know it but God? But yet God loves me in spite of all that. God's going to knit us together and he's going to bond us together. I haven't told you anything about me because there's, there's, this is it. This is me right here. This is what I want to become. I want to become like Jesus Christ. The old me has passed away. The old testimony. I find myself sometimes dwelling in the past and telling people what I used to be. And my flesh longs, longs for the excitement of the flesh. I, I have to admit that. And my spirit longs for the things of the spirit. Longs to know God. Longs to know Jesus Christ in the fullness of that resurrection power that Paul talked about. It longs to be, to just be in communion with God. Well, I wish I could just rip the flesh off and just say, I want to praise God. I just want to be with Jesus. I want to dance with him and sing with him. And I want to have the, I want to have the spirit of God just, just flow through me and just, I want to be, I've given myself to Jesus Christ to the best of my ability. All the things that I've ever done and I, and, and the devil says, Boy, you're terrible. And I says, praise God. There's somebody out there that needs to know exactly what, what happened to me. It, that God can work in an individual life. God comes down and he meets us on our basis. I've gone to different people for help and they've said, hey, you've got you've to stand on your own two feet. There comes a time when you have to discern the word of God, when the word of God has to work in and through you. And I said, praise God. I said, I don't want that. I want to hold on to somebody. I want to, I want to see something physical that I can grasp. And God keeps saying, lay hold of my promises, son. Lay hold of the promises and claim them. And you grab onto me, and I'll, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said. That's not my promises. You don't, you don't take anything I say here. You check it out with the Word of God. If the Word of God that you have says it, you believe it. Don't believe me or any of the men that preach here. Because I'm, I'm just as prone to error as anybody else. I'm flesh and blood, and, and I have a tendency to become proud. And if I'm proud, I can't remain open to the Spirit. I can't remain humble, and I get, I get puffed up. And Paul talks about that. David talked about it. He says, anybody that's proud is going to fall. And praise God, I just... Lord Jesus, you just, you just bless each and every one of us, Father. You have something for all of us, Father. And, and it's through your power and through your spirit that you can minister, that you can, that you can meet people's needs, Father. Lord, I don't even know why you would bring me from Chicago down here. But, Father, there's someone that needs 
to know that Jesus Christ loves them in the fullness, that there's no conditions on that love, that it's unconditional. And Father, I thank you that, that you've shown me that, that you love me in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my down sittings, that you love me, Father. And Lord, you just show the people, you just let the love of God flow out from myself, from each and every one of us, Father. You just love us all. You just wrap us up together, Father, and you put your arms around us right now and you knit our hearts together, Father, in love, in the perfect bond of unity. Father, I praise you and I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that it's because of him that we're here. I thank you that it's, it's not because of any man or because of the work of any man's hand, Father. This is your work here. You're working in our hearts and in our minds, Father. You're going to teach us new things. You're going to reveal great truths to us. And I thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, now I ask you to give us the blessing, Father, that you have for each and every one of us, Father. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Praise Jesus. slip of air when I sing a song that's kind of a theme song for deliverance. <clears throat> the key to deliverance is love. There's no way that you can work in deliverance without burning out unless the love of Jesus constantly refreshes, thrills, and fills you. It's not something that you do. It's something he does through you. You're not the water. You're just the pipe. And the idea is to get the pipe clean so the water won't taste funny when it comes through. And nothing wrong with the water. You know, if you go out someplace where there's a well and you draw water out of the tap, the water's clear, cool, and refreshing. You say, my, that's a good well. But if the water is discolored, has a funny taste, you say there's something wrong with that old pipe. What I'm saying is you don't even become conscious of the pipe unless there's a funny taste in it. We need to have God clean us up so there won't be any funny taste to the water of life coming through us. If they'll say what a wonderful Savior and not what a wonderful person you are or I am. It doesn't matter whether people see us, it matters that they see him. And I've run across people since I've been working in deliverance who burned out. Said, yeah, we used to do that too, you know. We found a better way. I've checked out their better way, and every time I've learned to know this, when they say they found a better way, my heart goes out to them because I know what's happened. They have burned out because they ran out of love. They tried to do it in the energy of the flesh, the intelligence, the mentality. They tried to depend on their minds, their physical strength, their spirituality, or whatever you want to call it, and you'll burn out every time. Just like a car without any oil will burn up, so a person in deliverance, you'll, you'll completely go out. And then you'll decide you're on the wrong track, and the devil will say, that's right, that's what I've been trying to tell you all the time. Get off this kick and get on something that's nice and sweet. Go with the glory boys, the hallelujah line. That's what I call them, the glory boys. You know, the ones that are out in the name of Jesus. You're free, brother, sister. Take it by faith now. Don't doubt God. No change, no difference, no difference, no deliverance, friend. I don't care who prays for you. If you're not different, you weren't delivered. No difference, no deliverance. This song has kind of been a real blessing to me because I've felt the thing that Bill Gaither felt, I guess, when he wrote it. I could never outlove the Lord. Now there have been times when giving and loving brought pain. And I promised I would never let it happen again. 
But I found out that loving was well worth the risk And that even in losing you win I'm going to live the way he wants me to live I'm going to give until there's just no more to give I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love For I could never, never out love my Lord Jesus showed me that only through dying I live And he gave when it seemed there was no more to give. Oh, he loved me when loving brought heartache and loss. He forgave me from an old rugged cross. I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. For I could never, never outlove my Lord. This is a verse the Lord gave me to go with us. When, if you would follow the steps of God's only dear Son, you must die every day if the victory is won. Let the Spirit of God your whole being control. Shout hallelujah, press on to the goal. Come on now. I'm going to live the way He wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. For I could never, never love my Lord. I believe that's what the Lord wants all of us to do. He set the pace and he said, follow me, didn't he? If you follow Jesus, you'll end up on a cross. There isn't any other way. If you follow Jesus all the way, you won't stop in Gethsemane, you'll stop at Calvary. That's the destination of every Christian who walks to the Lord. Did you know that? You say, well, you're scaring me. If I can scare you off, well, you wouldn't last anyway. You'd never make it to the end if you, wouldn't, if you would be scared off that easy. Brother David made some remarks this morning about the land, and I certainly agreed with him. But there's another uh, thing I want to mention because, well, first of all, let me say this. I preach more about demons in meetings like this than I ever preach at Hegwood's Church. As a matter of fact, you'll seldom hear demons preached on at all at our church. It's not necessary. I can preach on John 3.16. When we get through, we'll have demons manifesting all over the place. They know who we are. They know where we are. The demons knew we were coming here. They have a well-organized network of communication. And every person that is demonized in this whole area, the demons were alerted to keep them out of that meeting. Worley and that bunch of nuts from Chicago are coming down. 
and they're going to cause trouble, keep them out of those meetings. And that's why some of you have had trouble getting here, and some other folks haven't made it yet. You're going to have to climb fences to get to where God's moving, folks. Uh, if you're not willing to put out a little effort, you're going to miss the blessings of God. And you need to come to these meetings if you want help. If you won't put out the effort to get here, then God's probably not going to help you because you're not ready. Not because God's not able, just because you're not willing. And I don't want to be ugly or hateful or anything like that, but I'm telling you, God's going to move and He's going to set a lot of people free. He always does. And we praise Him for it. I want to mention some things about the land, and I don't plan to dwell on it. But I'm going to drop these on you if you've got your pencils. Jot these scriptures down. This will help you in understanding a little bit about deliverance. I'm hoping to get to the bread of the children if I don't get sidetracked. Uh, but I felt that I should mention these verses first. Exodus chapter 23, verses 27 uh, through 30. Exodus 23. Verses 27 through 30. God said, I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee, and I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, the Hittites from before thee. I will not drive them out. Notice this. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. Now this, people are always wondering, why isn't deliverance spelled out more definitely in the New Testament? In the first place it is. But there are still a lot of missing details that we'd like to know about spiritual warfare. Well, God doesn't waste anything. He figured a lot of folks wouldn't be interested in fooling with deliverance anyway, so he didn't bother to put it on the shelf where they could kick it around. So he hid a lot of the truth over in the Old Testament because he knew some of us would stumble into deliverance, and we desperately need information, scriptural backing, and understanding wisdom. And so he hid it in amongst his dealings with the people of Israel. We've just begun to uncover some of these nuggets. The book of Psalms is a warfare book. It's almost entirely about warfare with spiritual enemies that are after the soul of the man, not the body, but the soul. Now, David's physical enemies couldn't have cared less about his soul. They wanted to cut his throat. And yet, if you read the Psalms, you'll find over and over again the references to the battle. You don't need the angel of the Lord to chase human enemies, really. But yet the angel of the Lord was called in to chase the enemies of David. Also, the fear of God was commanded to come upon them. The confusion of the Lord was to come upon them. And if you read the Psalms, you'll find a lot of help in understanding this. In the Old Testament, in God's dealings with Israel, you'll find a lot of information about how spiritual warfare works and the, and the why of it. Here's one of the verses right here, why people don't get delivered all at once. In the first place, you couldn't take it. I doubt if the person doing the deliverance could take it. I'm super deliverer number one. When I speak, they flee. You may line up over there. You may touch me. Can you imagine what a mess that would be? But I'll guarantee you, after you've wiped out your pride on the floor down here, and the demons kicked, on, kicked you and spit on you and bit you and, and uh, chopped your eye open, I've had all those things happen to me and more, and I've been flung across the church and things of this sort, you just sort of get the idea that uh, you're going to have to have help, lots of it. And if God doesn't intervene, you sure are up the creek without a paddle. And you don't have any trouble understanding who is doing the delivering and who's doing the work. You just happen to be a soldier in the field. And soldiers sometimes get wounded, so there's nothing wrong with that. We thought we thought, call it battle scars. Most of our people got battle scars. And uh, you will, too, if you get into this thing. The children of Israel had a divine right to the land in which they were marching. They had the title deed from God. He made the land. I guess he could give it to whoever he wanted to. And he said, it's yours. It's all yours. Now just go in. When they got there, the Canaanites and all those other folks said, oh, I beg your pardon. Well, we'll just pack right up and move. I'm so sorry. We didn't realize we took your place. Oh, no, they didn't. Listen, they had walled cities. They had powerful armies, chariots of iron. They had marching armies. And they said, no way will we let you have this. We've been here for a long time. Boy, how many times have I heard that? 
No, I will not leave Wimworthy. I've been here a long time, and we're not going. She belongs to us. <laughs> I like to hear them say that. That means you're going to have a tussle. I mean, I hate these cowardly ones that just flush and run real easy. You know, most people, well, maybe I shouldn't say that, a lot of people who are in deliverance, I <clears throat> feel kind of sorry for them because they come to me and say, oh, well, there's no trouble. All you do is just speak and they leave. You know what I, I found out? They've been batting butterflies and chasing blackbirds. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. The blackbirds and the butterflies need to go, but they'll go very easily. You can speak and they will run. They will come out very easily. But I challenge you to grab a water buffalo or a rhinoceros by the tail and say, come out there, big boy. He'll turn around and say, what did you say? Who do you think you are? No way. You say, but you're defeated in Jesus' name. He said, that's what you think. Now, they may be defeated, but I'll guarantee you one thing. They put up a fight and retreat. If you don't believe that, then you don't know what's all about yet. But you won't have much pride left when, when you get through wiping it out on the floor a little bit. Just about time you think you've got it all down pat, you'll hit a demon that'll reverse everything you know. I remember one time there was a fellow who'd had a great deal of success in binding a wild demon that was thrashing around the workers couldn't control, and he'd just walk over and say, I bind you in Jesus' name, the thing would just freeze. Well, he'd done that very successfully three or four times, and naturally he felt confident about it. I mean, wouldn't you? So there was a little old girl. Boy, it was wild. It was going berserk. It was thrashing around like a thrashing machine. And the workers were trying everywhere in the world to keep the girl from hurting herself and, and uh, get it stilled out. And they tried binding. Nothing worked. The thing wouldn't respond at all. So this man rushed over, and he was going to help him. He said, I bind you in Jesus' name. And the thing held up just like slapped his jaw out of joint. Amen. And he looked like this, and he said, I bind you. And it slapped him again. Now, those others hadn't done that. But you know, your pride takes quite a beating in something like that. <laughs> Well, just about time you think you've learned it, you'll, uh, you'll run across one that doesn't know that you know it. <laughs> now, he'll show you a thing or two. Then you know what you are? You're shut up to faith again. Now, let me show you the parallel passage in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I won't dwell on that too much. Moreover, the Lord thy God, verse 20, Deuteronomy 7, 20. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them, Till they that are left and hide themselves from before thee be destroyed. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them. For the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little, that thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Now I want you to parallel that beast of the field. You remember Paul wrote about the beast? He fought beast at Ephesus. I used to wonder what those were until I got in deliverance. Then I had no doubt about it. It's also Ephesians has that armor described, doesn't it? And I think I'm going to get to preach on the armor sometime. One of these preachers doesn't steal my thunder. But uh, in case I don't, I'm going to steal something from them. You know, it talks about having done all to stand. And that sounds so static, doesn't it? But if you go back and check the Greek out, you know what he's talking about? The word to stand used there in that particular passage means it was used when a gladiator had been fighting in the arena. And he had defeated and disarmed his enemy. The enemy was on the ground, and he had the point of his sword at his throat. And he looked to the ruler of the games as to when and how to dispatch him. Having done all to stand. Isn't that great? When you do all the others, you can stand with your sword at the tip, waiting for the orders from up high, how to get rid of this thing. Praise the Lord. He didn't overlook anything in it. Now, this business about the land, think of the land as being your body. It's invaded by trespassers, squatters, and interlopers who've been there for a long time. Some of them you inherited. You wouldn't believe how far back some of these curses go. We traced some of them back 1,500 years or more. They jump third, to the third and fourth generation. All you need is one, one dummy in the bunch to pick it up, and he'll pass it on the, like the plague to the next generation for three more, four more generations. And it's a curse from God, dear friends, so it needs to be taken care of. It's very serious business. Talking about the occult. If you're not aware of that, pick up the occult track back there. Check it out. It's extremely serious. Your grandpappy was in water witching. Boy, you got him. 
If your grandma stirred up a little uh, medicine, you know, and she talked to it while she was stirring it, yeah, you got them. All those little nice things, you know. You know, if you, uh, you, rub, you cut an Irish potato in half, you rub it on a wart, throw it over your left sh shoulder at midnight when a black cat runs across behind or buried under the northwest corner of the house at the full little moon or something, and sure enough, the wart go away, yeah, that's right, you may have cancer in place of it. Or maybe you have a marital breakup, homosexuality, su suicide, insanity. Those are a few nice swaps. You always swap up when you swap with the devil. That's how Christian science seals, by swapping. I mean, you know, you swap a wart on your hand for a cancer. Swap a headache for a brain tumor. That's a pretty good swap, wouldn't you say? The devil was getting the best of the deal. That's the, that's the way you do it. These psychic surgeons you've heard about, within two years, nearly all their patients have committed suicide, had marriage breakups, turned into homosexuals, murderers, or all kinds of crazy things have happened to them, eaten up with cancers. That's what happens when you fool with the devil. Now, but I just gave you these to meditate on and not to get discouraged. He said, I'll deliver you by little and by little. If he delivered you all at once, you couldn't take it anyhow. Some people are so full of demons, you pull them all out once, there wasn't anything left to hold the walls up. I mean, it'd be like an egg without any egg in it. Nothing but the little hollow shell. And God takes them out by little and lets you build up. He didn't waste anything either. If you're just going to haul off and fritter it away and throw it away, there's no use you, in you getting it all out and then have it all come back eightfold, right? Eight for one, that's pretty bad. Seven for one, seven more. Eight, eight for one, that's pretty bad change. God works with us, and he does it very sensibly. Now, before I get into the main thing I wanted to talk about today... Uh, some people have asked some questions. They've watched our workers work and have, made, have remarked to me about some things they were impressed about. And let me just mention this. We may be working deliverance a little differently from where you've seen it before. We don't say that we have the only way of doing it, but the way we that we do deliverance has worked and has worked well for literally hundreds of people. Our church, because it's 97% workers, can process an almost unbelievable number of people through deliverance in a single service. And we believe that every church should be set up this way. We believe that everybody's in the battle. Everybody ought to witness and win. Everybody ought to be able to pray for the sick. And everybody ought to deliver people from demons. And because, uh, you know, if you happen to be the only one in the business, in a place the size we are, well, then you get swamped with all the business. So we stay in deliverance quite a bit because everybody comes in looking for help. Now... Let me mention some things that we have learned that might be helpful to you. The demons are not deaf. Don't get into a shouting match ever with the demons. Let them do all the screaming. You talk very quietly. Matter of fact, you could encourage them by yelling at them. Tell you why. Because if you are arguing with somebody and you're not sure of your point, your voice will automatically get louder because you're not sure that you're right. And you could encourage the demons to think, well, they're not really sure of themselves because they're getting all excited and, and, and shouting. Maybe they're not sure. I'll hold on tighter. You want to scare the daylights out of them? Lower your voice to just above a whisper. Refuse to get upset. Now, I know how it is, if you, especially if you get new in this. It's like a coon dog that spots a coon. He gets excited. He's about to climb that tree because he sees that thing up there, and he wants to, he wants to get a hold of that. And that's the way it is with believers when they get on the trail of demons and they spot a real live one. they got a live one on the string. Good lands are living there in one. It sure enough is real. And they get all excited and their voice goes up and it gets so loud until uh, it sounds like uh, I don't know what around. And you can't hear your ears and a lot of demons feed on confusion. Don't give them anything to feed on. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Listen, we're backed up on bedrock. We're on the blood of Jesus, on the finished work. We have the authority of his name. And the, his name can be whispered and will scare the living hound out of the demons. They start yelling at me. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And they yell louder and I just get quieter. I don't have to be afraid of them. Now, if you want to scare the demons, you get quiet and just back up on your authority. It's Jesus. You don't have to get upset and excited. Just if you get a little tired, switch to a prayer language. That'll arrest you and keep the tension on the demon. That's right. 
Didn't you know that praying in tongues rests you physically as well as spiritually and mentally? Sure. So when I get tired, I just rest while the demon just gets under misery. And I just sit there and smile, pray in tongues. I've had them say, shut up, can't you talk in English? I said, I will in a minute. I said, don't you enjoy this? He said, not particularly. <laughs> See, the Holy Spirit's just busy just making hash up. They can't understand the tongues, by the way. The tongues of men and angels. Now, God can shut it off when he doesn't want them to hear it. But when you're dealing in deliverance, the demons can understand it. And they don't like what they hear. They'll lie and tell you they can't understand it. Don't you believe them? I know we've had them say, I don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're saying either. I said, well, nevertheless, here goes, and we just keep a going. That's why I said, when I'm looking at me, and said, don't you say that about me. You have no right. I'm not that bad. I said, I thought you couldn't understand. He said, shut your mouth. Of course they can understand. Tongue of men and angels, why wouldn't they? Sure they understand when God wants them to. But don't be, uh, don't be upset and say, oh, good night. Every time I pray in tongues, the demons are over listening. Not necessarily. If God wants to shut them out, he can, he can tune them out, too. If he's got some private stuff going on, you, you can bet they're tuned out. They've got their waves jammed. But in praying in tongues, you'll rest yourself and weary the demons. And there are times, friend, when you have to wear them out. You say, well, uh, Jesus just spoke and they came out. Isn't that wonderful? It's not quite like you think it is, though, because I, if you go back to the Greek, where he dealt with the Gadarene, for instance, and that, well, the, pa the passage is always quoted. It's, uh, he spoke the word and they came out. Only thing is, the Greek doesn't say that. It says they came out because of his discourse. And you remember in the Gadarene, in the case of the Gadarene, it says uh, the demon said, uh, why have you come to torment us? And the Greek says, because Jesus kept on saying to them over and over again, come out of him. See, a lot of people would learn something if they just go to some of these Greek, uh, they don't have to be a Greek student. You can just go and dig up what somebody else knows. But you can learn a lot from the English. So don't worry too much about the Greek if you haven't covered the English yet. But I just dropped that in on you for uh, just a little bombshell for you to deal with and think about. So when you're dealing with demons, don't think you have to get loud. I've heard of people who manhandle the people in deliverance. We never do that. If you're going to work in deliverance, be prepared to be punched in the nose, eyes, kicked, bit, spit on, and never, never retaliate. Amen. I've heard about and read about people who haul off and slap somebody or hit them, and I just shuddered. I could not imagine myself or any of our workers ever doing that. Listen, this is a sacrificial love service. You give yourself. If you can't do that, you're not ready to work in deliverance yet. You just praise the Lord. If you're hurting bad enough, get one of the workers to pray for you. That's all. No problem. We've never had anybody seriously hurt. We've had some that were stunned for a little bit. I had my eye ripped open with a karate chop about five stitches wide. Still got the scar up here. The fellow prayed for me. I almost prayed the scar away so I wouldn't have anything to show for it. But... Uh, <laughs> Hey, uh, but uh, a Moody Bible Institute student um, uh, who had been out on a short-term mission in Germany over the thing came back and he'd been into karate. And so the karate spirit was rather nasty and he was telling me he wasn't coming out. So I proceeded to get my little bag of tools out and begin to needle him with various things that I found make them extremely uncomfortable. He got so uncomfortable he ripped an arm, arm loose and he whopped me and laid my eye open. And blood came out. Well, I moved back. He didn't get any help because the worker just moved in on him. It didn't give him any help. But I just stepped back, and one of the boys said, Oh, it's going to take four or five stitches to close past where his eye. And I have a little Polish Catholic man, a very Catholic, who is one of our elders, and he, he said, Oh, no, it's not. Come over here, Wayne. And we sat down on the platform. And he first he put his hand over there. He said, I rebuke this blood and commanded to stop in Jesus' name. Boy, it shut off just like a faucet. Then he pushed it together and he said, now you stay in Jesus' name and you heal right now. He was just real angry. And um, then uh, he said, now every bit of that pain, leave his head. And it just went like that. He said, now go wash your face, Lynn. So I went back to the laboratory, washed my face. I had a little thin red line. It never was bruised. It never swelled. never was sore. 
There were some people got their eyes open. Some visitors were shocked when they saw that blood shut off. Because, I mean, it was coming down. It was a mess. I went back over to the demon, and I said, How do you like my eye? <laughs> he said, I meant to kill you, Winworthy. I said, Well, that just goes to show you can't always do what you want to, can you? Oh, listen, they can't. They threaten a lot of things. They can't. If they tell me they're going to kill me, I say they have to get in line. There's several hundred head of them. Got dibs on my scalp. Mm, don't let them worry. People say, oh, this thing keeps telling me I'm going to kill you. You should say, really? <gasps> Praise the Lord. I'll tell Jesus you helped me get there when I get to heaven. They'll quit it if you do that. They're telling you to scare you. What do you want to let it play in their hands for? No way. Keep keep cool and keep quiet when you're working with demons. Move in love. Let one person lead the attack. Let the others stand by. Let your gifts operate. Supply knowledge, but don't try to overrun each other. If you're going to pray, pray very quietly. Keep it quiet. The demons hate it. They hate quietness. They want noise and confusion. So we give them quietness and confidence. I mean, we have the confidence and the quietness, and they have the upset. So those are just words I'd say if you're going to. And also, let me say this, too. If some of you are not familiar with deliverance and you'd like to know about deliverance, don't hesitate to come up where the workers are working. If you're a little uneasy, then don't touch the person. Demons can transfer by a touch. And don't let that scare you because, I mean, you, you, if you're under the blood, they're not going to. But if you want to walk up, you need to walk up where the workers are working. Several people have remarked to me, said, I never saw deliverance like your folks do it. said, it's so quiet. I said, well, if there's any noise, we figure the demons will take care of that. We're interested in getting the people free. If you want to know, you need to come up close because you'll never hear what our workers are saying unless you're up close. Also, if something is discerned that has to do with a sexual or some kind of a private nature, you'll see our workers immediately make it private. And they'll put their hand over the person's ear and begin to speak directly to the demons in the person's ear. And we, we have had people walk up and say, what was that? What was that? I looked up one time and I said, if God wanted you to know, he'd tell you. He knew I wouldn't go off and gossip about it. He's afraid you would, so he didn't tell you. It doesn't make any difference what people have because sometimes they've done the thing, sometimes they haven't. It doesn't make any difference if they want to be free God isn't particularly the concern. He's just cleaning house. But if you want to learn, the best way to learn is walk up and go. The reason we have so many workers is because when, when somebody gets born again, we stick a Bible in one hand and say, grab a leg with the other one. And so we have a whole church full of workers. Don't you tell them any different now. They don't know that that's not the way you're supposed to do it. I try to keep them away from other churches for a while so they won't know the difference. Because they think that you're supposed to witness, you're supposed to pray, and you're supposed to deliver people just as soon as you're born, practically. You get under the wing of another believer, you put them with somebody else, say, okay, get over and help them. Watch and see what they do. For years, and when I was a preacher, pull the load like to broke my big back. I run my little fat legs off running all over the country, taking care of everything. But you know, God's got a better way. He's got a whole body that's just dying to get involved if you give them half a chance. Pull them in. Put the babies in there. They learn quicker than the older folks sometimes. They don't have as much to be, well, I don't know about. Get the babies in there. They don't know the difference. You just say, do this and do that. And say, okay. <laughs> Get some born-again Roman Catholics. Boy, they're really good. They're used to being under authority, so they don't question it. You just go ahead and tell them, get to work. They'll say, yes, sir. And praise the Lord. My church is over half converted Roman Catholics. If I preach on a... <laughs> I preached one time. I came back from Pittsburgh. Law me, I, my soul was stirred in me by the idolatry I had witnessed in a charismatic conference. I came back. I, I had fire in my eyes. I was hollering worse than David. <laughs> but you know, I came back and I preached on... The spirits of Babylon, out of Revelation. Oh, oh my, you should have seen what happened. I'm telling you, the first one to hit the aisle was a little 
Polish Catholic man, he came up and said, Oh, Pastor Worley, I must have heard one of those things that my stomach is killing me. I said, All right, I laid hands on him. I said, Come out of him. And he said, No, leave me alone. And that commenced the three hour one. And boy, they were dropping like flies all over just about every Catholic person I remember. Boy, they were coming out of them like crazy. Mariolatry, Holy Eucharist, Confession, Fear of the Priest, all these nice ones, you know. Now, anyhow, if you want to learn, come up where it's going on and listen and learn. Pitch in and learn. Get kicked a few times. That'll help you. I hope we don't land a spitting one here in your nice red carpet, Jean. We haven't had a spitting one lately. I'm not asking for it, Lord. Just to... <laughs> they are the nastiest things. But if you are interested in deliverance, move on up. Don't hang back. You say, well, I'm scared. Oh, come on up here. Nothing's going to hurt you. you that scared, they probably wouldn't even have you. <laughs> no, seriously, don't, don't, don't let the devil scare you out. Learn what you can do. If you find somebody that knows how to do something, get up there and learn what they know. God will teach you if you're helping. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 7, please. Get Mark chapter 7 and hold your place, and I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to start in Matthew and end up in Mark. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, but she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not meat, it's not fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now go to Mark chapter 7. Mark seven twenty four. And from thence Jesus arose, went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. You can stop and preach a sermon on the fact that Jesus can't be hid even though he goes in the house. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he'd cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it's not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. She answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil has gone out of thy daughter. When she has come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. I want us to talk about this woman for a little bit, learn some lessons. The bread of the children is deliverance. Deliverance was not intended for lost people. You may need to bind and rebuke Satan to win somebody to Christ, because if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded their minds that they might not see and believe. And the devil will interfere with their thinking, and, not, and they're not able to believe. And in my ministry many years ago, I discovered sometimes I would come across a person very eager to accept the Lord, but when it came to actually asking Jesus in their heart, they could not do it, no matter how they tried. And because I ran across that verse in Corinthians about, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, I began to rebuke Satan and tell him to release their minds and allow them to believe the gospel, and I never yet have seen one fail to accept the Lord. So if you run across a case where a person genuinely wants to accept the Lord and cannot, I'd suggest you take authority over the, the uh, blinding power of the devil, and they will be able to believe. Now, this works when people are willing and anxious to accept the Lord. Now, this woman comes. She's a Gentile, and her daughter has an unclean spirit. She comes and falls at the feet of Jesus. She's certainly not a proud woman. She comes and she says... Would you please help me? The first uh, version I read in, in Matthew said, she said, Lord, help me. Now, if you really get desperate for help, you're in a position where Jesus can help you. But notice what he did. 
He, uh, he said, let the children first be filled. It's not meat to take the bread of the children and throw it out to dogs. Now, the Hebrews, the Jews today, if you're around some Jewish people and they're speaking in Yiddish, uh, you may hear them, or they may see them glance in your direction and say something about goyim. And goyim is their word for Gentile, and it means dog. You may see them smiling, they'll be goyim, you know, and you think, oh, that's nice, yeah. You don't know, they just called you a dog. And this was a Jewish word for Gentile. Now he comes, Jesus comes, here's this poor woman, she's all beside herself, she's upset, her daughter has an unclean spirit, and she comes and she says, Oh Lord, please help me get this evil spirit out of my daughter. And he does a very strange thing, and it seems almost cruel, because he said, Well, I can't do that. I'm sent to feed the children. And he said, it's not meat or fitting to take the bread that belongs to the children and turn around and feed it to the dogs. Sorry, you're not at the table. Now, this woman, if she had been like a lot of people today, she would said, what? Call me a dog. I'll just take my business someplace else. Not going to call me a dog. Very idea. I thought you helped people. Didn't know you went around insulting people. Here I came. Begging for help. You call me a dog. And she could have got her feathers ruffled. A lot of people do, don't they? We once in a while, we have somebody come to our church. They're looking for deliverance. So we say, well, okay. And I'll call one of the workers. I say, what's your trouble? They'll tell me. I'll, say, I'll tell one of my workers. I'll call somebody up. Usually, a lot of times you have a grown man who comes. I know one of the New Testimonies says that said this man said, uh, I went up there confidently to Pastor Worley and and he talked to him in a minute, and then he gave a high sign. Here comes some kid that was uh, young enough to be my boy. And he said, uh, take this man and do this and this and this. And I looked at him and thought, my, my problems are serious. What do you mean give this kid? This kid don't know nothing. But, you know, he was desperate, so he just decided to play along with it. And he said, law me. He said, that kid knew what he was talking about. I said, well, of course. You don't think I'd turn Joe somebody to know what they're doing. I said, don't let those kids... Use food, you. I said, they've been raised up in this. That's all they know. Just Jesus and getting people free. So don't, don't feel neglected, by the way, if, if I may shuttle you to somebody else if I find out what your problem is. I'm not the only one who can help you. Did you know that? Jesus is going to help you. And if you're not willing to be helped by whoever comes along, you're not willing to be helped. Did you know that? You say, well, my problem is serious. Is that so? We haven't met that one over 150 times in the last year. You just think it, but you, of course your sore toe is sore than anybody else's sore toe because it's hooked on to you. I know my sore toe is more sore than yours. You just think you have problems. You ought to have mine. See? That's the way we all feel, naturally. But what I'm saying is this woman could have gotten huffy. And we've had people come, and, you know, and, and we talk to them, and I'd say, has anybody talked to you about the occult? No, my problem is not the occult, it's this. I called the Bible, I said, take them through the occult and through forgiveness. I told you my problem wasn't the occult. I said, I thought you needed help. Well, I do. I said, well, then you'll have to go our route. We're going to clear the underbrush, and then we're going to saw the trees down. No use in our workers getting scratched up and worn out trying to saw the trees down with all that underbrush around there to protect them. Besides that, half the time, the occult is the thing, the, the thing that's at the root of the thing. The reason most people can't speak in tongues is because of the occult. Almost everybody who comes to our church seeking a new language gets it on the spot or within a week after they're prayed for. And nearly every time we've had people that about everybody in the country pray for them, they've been begging the Lord for tongues for 20 years, and they come in there, and nobody's ever talked to them about the occult. We go, go in and tear off the occult uh, bondage that's in there, show them how to renounce it, close the door to Satan, and then the tongue just comes rushing. So getting free from the occult is the key to a lot of things. The occult and unforgiveness are two of the biggest blocks to complete healing and complete deliverance, and that's why we always check the seal and be sure the drag lines are up, and then we go after the tree. This woman could have gotten awfully huffy, and a lot of people do, you know. They think, well, I know more about this than you do. Well, if you do, why, why are you still in bondage? I didn't come asking you for help. You came asking for help. I had one young lady down in Houston. We had people lined up all over the place. I never saw so many people in my life. They just came and worked all day long and into the night, every night. As a matter of fact, I collapsed when I came home. I was so worn out. But uh, 
There just was no place to stop. And this young lady came. She was about 17. Her boyfriend was with her and her girlfriend. And he came up in line. They'd been staying in line a while. And usually I'd stay in line about three hours, so they'd been there. I was praying for one after the other. My workers were busy. Every worker I had was tied down and just as busy as I was. I didn't have time to See, our workers, don't, we don't have time to help each other. You've got to learn. I mean, we get them learning in a hurry because once you get out on your own, boy, you don't have time. To, everybody's busy. Nobody has time. You have to learn. We push them through basic training in a hurry so they can get out on their own and help people. But this girl came up, and so I started praying with her, and so she got the giggles. The little, her little girlfriend standing over there, and they kind of got snicking around. I said, uh, I thought you said you wanted help. Oh, oh, I do, I do. I said, well, you straighten up, because I don't fool with you, lady. And so she straightened up, you know, I started again. And she started acting up and making some little funny remark to her girlfriend over there. I said, all right, yeah, you're through. Next. Then she got hysterical. She said, well, I want you to pray with me. I said, girl, I ain't got time to fool with you. I said, I'm not playing fun and games, girl. I said, there's 15 people standing here in line waiting to be prayed for. You think I'm going to waste time with you? I said, you go home and repent, and if you can live with your demons, help yourself. But I doubt if you'll sleep tonight. Her boyfriend came up to me about a half an hour later. He said, I swear you've got to pray with my girlfriend. I said, I'm busy. Yeah, but she's hysterical. She's afraid to go home. I said, that's too bad. I said, I've got all these people that are willing to cooperate and do anything they can to get rid of their demons. And I said, I ain't got time to I said, bring her tomorrow night. She can get in line again. Listen, friend, this is not fun and games time. This is dead serious. The people who are desperate get free. Praise the Lord, they get free. This woman came in desperation, fell at the feet of Jesus, and he said, I can't give you any bread off the table. It's for the children. You don't even belong to the household. You're in the animal kingdom. You're a dog. Instead of getting huffy, she said, Okay, Lord, you can call me anything you want to. Okay, I'm a dog. But, Lord, let me remind you of something. I'm not asking for the whole loaf. Even the dogs get to scrounge around on the table and grab the crumbs when they fall off the table. I just want a crumb. Ooh, Jesus turned and looked at her said, Because of this saying. You've got it, it's done. Now, there was, Jesus wasn't cruel. He stretched her out, and her faith came back just like steel. He couldn't shake her loose. A lot of people, you know, if the Lord were to approach them like that, they'd go, What? Who does he think he is putting me off? After all. I said, I might have a demon. But I look. He's looking for the people who mean business. Lord, I got trouble. Lord, I can't handle it. I can't hack it. I can't stand it. You help me, please. And no matter what the Lord does, I just keep on hanging on. So I'm going to hang on. No way. You're not getting away, Lord. You're, they're like Peter was. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. I guess Peter was pretty discouraged when all the crowd left, wouldn't you be? How would you like it if your preacher preached and was doing such a good job? He had 15, 20,000 people in the congregation. And then he turned around and started preaching, and everybody started leaving. And you came out and said, uh, Preacher, don't you think you ought to kind of tone it down a little bit? I think we're kind of offending some folks. Uh, maybe you could kind of ease it around a different way. And he just preached harder. By the they all left, and there just 12 of them standing there. And they look in there. All their records were ruined. The bus program collapsed. I mean, they didn't have any congregation anymore. They was the biggest, now they're the littlest. They're looking around kind of discouraged, and Jesus said, Well, will you also go away? Peter said, Well, I guess we would, but Lord, where would we go? You've already messed us up. Did you know something? Some of you messed up. You can holler and fuss and fume and everything else, but you messed up. You didn't even talk about leaving and doing this, that, and you're not going to do it. You're hung up high in a kite. You couldn't get loose if you tried. You say, I'm just going to give up. Go ahead. I tried that one time. I did. I went through a period of my life, and I just thought, well, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to, Lord, I just quit. Nothing happened. 
I found out I could shake on the rock, and the rock never shook under me. It just stood still. <laughs> so I was like the little kid that was walking across the street, little toddler. He had hold of his daddy's hand. And the little boy thought he was hanging on to daddy's hand real tight. When the little fellow tripped, all of a sudden the strength of the father's hand came into view. And instead of falling, the little one just swung. And the, the grip of the father hung on. And he found out where the strength was. It was in the father's hand, not in that little kid's hand. That little kid couldn't hold on for a minute. He'd have, got, he'd have fallen. Listen, when you take a tumble, you'll find out where the strength is. It's in the father's hand. You may swing, but you're not going to go. He's got you. And I'll guarantee you something. You say, well, he'll let me go. No, he won't. He paid too much for you. Amen. You're rotten and you're not worth it, but he paid for you and he's going to keep you. No, not anybody. He paid for us. He paid for Jesus' blood for us. That's all right. He's going to keep us, too. You know something? You can be so sure of the grace of God. You can just quit worrying about your salvation and trying to make it to the end and all this kind of stuff. You don't have to do that. The amazing grace of God is so sure and so steadfast. I can swing out over hell on a rotten corn stalk and sing an amazing grace and never, never feel a flicker of fear. Now, you look at me and see if you think a rotten corn stalk at old me. Hmm? But not in use for you to doubt God. Jesus came through when the woman was desperate, when she would not be turned aside, and it didn't make a difference what people said or thought about her. She said, Nevertheless, Lord, I've got to have it. If you'll hang in there with God, you'll get what you want. Now, the deliverance is the bread of the children. Did you notice what Jesus called it? It's not for the outsiders, it's for the insiders. It's been overlooked so many years. The first thing Jesus mentioned after the Great Commission was deliverance from evil spirits. The last thing being restored to the church is deliverance from evil spirits. Everything else is moving in place. The deliverance is coming into its own. We had a prophecy in California that said this is the year of deliverance. And it said the churches and the preachers who reject deliverance in this year, if they hear the message of deliverance, and they turn their backs on it, those churches and preachers are going to go into a downward spiral and they'll never come out of it. It's very serious. The prophecy went on to say that they, the church is no longer able to survive without deliverance. The occult revolution power of the witchcraft and all the other things that are moving in so rapidly and the darkness is closing in so fast. The church can no longer survive without a balanced ministry of deliverance. Now, let me say this quickly because I'm... You say, well, Worley, you know, he thinks there's a demon behind every bush and one behind every rock. I feel like Hobart Freeman. Somebody said that. They accused him of doing that. He said, that's not so. Now, if you said a couple of dozen, you might be right. But lest I be misunderstood, let me say again, deliverance is not a cure-all. It's not a substitute for confessing your sins. It's not a substitute for 1 John 1, 9, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's not a substitute for prayer. It's not a substitute for walking with the Lord. It's not a substitute for faithfulness. It's not a substitute for any of those things. Don't ever get the idea. I can run out and sin, then I'll run down and sit in the deliverance chair and get it all fixed up. By little and by little it'll come. It's not that easy, friend. God made it that way because he knew how we were. We're always looking for something easy, something quick. What deliverance will do, nothing else will do, though. If you need deliverance, no amount of praise is going to fix it. No amount of Bible study will correct it. No amount of dedication. No. Let, let me back up just a minute. I said no amount of Bible study. Bible study always will inhibit and hinder the work of evil spirits. Prayer will inhibit and hinder. But if they're strong, it won't stop them. But it will help. That's how a lot of fundamental Christians have survived. They've soaked themselves so in the Bible that the demons don't have much elbow room, and they can't do as much as they would. You wonder how they out here. But it'd be better, wouldn't it, if you didn't have to put on all fronts fighting the demons and you could devote your whole self to all these other good things that will develop you as a believer. Get rid of the demons. Now, the demon is rooted in the old sin nature. It is not in the new nature. 
cannot be. Did you know you got two pieces inside of you? You're schizophrenic as all get out. Did you know that? You got an old man and a new man on the inside. Black dog and white dog, they fight all the time. The one you say sick them to wins. <clears throat> Which side do you own? Now, the old sin nature is in there, and that's the place where the demons root. If you didn't have an old sin nature, a, a nary a demon could get a hold of with you at all. First John is very explicit. The new man is not touched by that. You say, well, oh, but I can't go with that, Pastor Worley. I'm sorry. I, I believe you are sincere and everything, but you're just dead wrong. Because I'm filled with the Spirit. Is that so? And that's great. How do you think the Holy Spirit gets along with the old sin nature? You think it's somehow sanctified because he moved in? You think he enjoys being in there with that thing? The Holy Spirit can coexist with the old sin nature, and he can coexist with the weeds that grow out of it called the demons. Now, you weed the garden, and God will do it. The, demon, the old sin nature makes people peep over the cliff. Now, that's stupid and dangerous because you could slip and fall and hurt yourself. You look over into the forbidden territory, you know. But if you have a demon, he'll how often give you the wherewithal to go over. In other words, he reinforces the old sin nature. And he hides within your personality, and if he can make you think that this is normal and natural, then he's so much better off because you'll never suspect where the real trouble lies. I've always been like this. This sort of thing runs in our family. Oh, that's immediately suspect. You know, my dad had a bad temper, too. Mm hmm That's interesting. You know, my, all my mama's folks, you know, the, the women developed cancer. Mm hmm Isn't that interesting? All these hereditary things have a reason, friend. Go to Breaking Curses. Pick up that track on vows and curses back there. Go to Breaking Curses. I'd rather break one that wasn't there than to miss one that was. And you'd be surprised at what will happen in the spiritual realm when you start plowing into this thing. God has made provision for us, but it's not automatic. He provided salvation. Is salvation automatic? You have to receive Christ, don't you? He provides a new tongue. Is that automatic? You have to receive it, don't you? He provides deliverance. Is it automatic? No, sir. I'm under the blood, preacher. I've had people get plumb mad at me at church. Say, I'm under the blood. I said, Preem, me too. Wouldn't be any other place. Well, then I don't have any demons. I said, all right. Why are you getting so upset? I can bear you having demons. If you can. I wouldn't sit here and argue with you about whether you've got them or not. There's 10, 15 people there that are convinced they got them. They won't get rid of them. You think a Christian have them? That's the only kind we deal with. People not saved, first thing we do is lead them to the Lord. Well, a lost person wouldn't have a chance if you cast a demon out of them. Did you know that? You cast a demon out of them, send him out all clean and garnished. What did Jesus say? That demon would come back with seven worse. Don't, don't, don't clean up a lost person to turn him out to the devil. You might have to clean him up a little bit to get him to the Lord, but get him saved. Then he's got a foundation. He's got the blood. He's got all these spiritual defenses to fight with. And hopefully the churches are going to begin to teach this to the people so they'll be stronger. Put up a fight with the devil. Don't give up. Don't give into it. Don't just say, well, I can't. Nothing I can do about it. Now, you know that's not so. Why would God have made provision? for deliverance if there's nothing you could do. God's waiting for people to cry. Joel 2.32, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. By all means, seek the help of the Lord. Is there anybody here who needs to seek the Lord this morning, this afternoon? Let me mention this to you. In a crowd this size, you never know. Have you ever asked Jesus in your heart? Are you sure of your relationship with him? A boy, a girl, a man, a woman. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart,
Sorry, you're not sure about your relationship to him. Let me urge you to make sure today. You could pray something like this. Now, do it out loud because the devil will convince you you never did it if you just do it in your mind. That's right. He'll talk to you out loud before you get out the door. Something like this. Very simple. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you now. Come in. Save me from all my sins. If you mean business, he'll come in. If he's already there, he'll clear up the confusion. If neither one of those things seems to happen, come up here and tell me or one of the workers around the front and let them sit down with the scriptures and help you see what God says. That's what you need. You need to know what God says, not what you think, and not even what you feel. Not saved by feelings. It sure feels good to be saved, but uh, you're not saved that way. And I'd rather be saved than feel saved if I had to take a pick. I don't think you have to. I think you can be saved and feel it too. But uh, a lot of times people are confused and they have various reasons why they're having difficulty. So let's have some music. And if you need help, if you're being driven, harassed, tormented, that's the sign of a demon. You're being defeated in the same old areas over and over again, and there's no way that you can get relief from what you're thinking. You, you try all the spiritual remedies, and they don't work right. By all means, try Jesus. The remedy for the old sin nature is to crucify it with Christ, but you'll never crucify a demon. He won't submit to it. The remedy for a demon is to cast him out in Jesus' name. And if you need help today, or you think you do, by all means, come and let's let the Lord help you. We're not going to pressure you. Let's stand. This is the end of this message. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.